Afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the talk. Uh, first thing I'm going to say is there is another talk on Hadoop for reverse engineering, which is going to be a lot more technical than the one I'm giving. So anyone here who's looking for the ins and outs of the technology, that's probably a better talk. I'm just saying that right now to set expectations. Um, I'm going to be laying out, uh, oh, sorry, introduce myself, Phil Huggins, Stroz Freeberg. Um, I have been working with a number of companies over the last year and a half around security analytics, uh, whether that be at strategic level, whether that be planning their implementations, um, and whether that be maturing their existing capabilities. I'm going to talk a little bit about big data and cyber, the two buzzwords that I'm sure everyone's really happy to hear. Uh, a little bit about situational awareness and, and how this is all being tied together, uh, and then some of the opportunities I see on the horizon that we need to make sure we don't back ourselves into a corner and we can't take advantage of. Ask questions as we go along. Uh, heckles wait to the end. Yeah, well, you know, while well, I'm here, but I won't listen. Um, so big data, massively overused buzzword. Everybody and their dog, big data's everything now. Um, there were a, a few useful definitions. Doug Laney came up with the three Vs originally. I'm sure everyone's heard it, volume, velocity, variety. It's worth bearing that in mind. Uh, a lot of what we see is probably more to do with variety than volume uh, in a lot of the analytics we look at. We've also seen a couple of other Vs, because everyone likes adding on more words, value and veracity. Uh, and the important thing here is, are we getting return on investment? Are we making uh, good investments when we're doing this sort of thing? Uh, and can we trust the answers these platforms are giving us? There's a lot of really interesting and fun ways you can play with data, you can learn from it, you can make predictions. Do you want to bet your business on it? And there's, there's some real interesting conversations to have about that. So first thing, I'm going to use the term big data. I don't like it. I think there are better terms. And I think this is a more useful way of thinking about the topic. Data engineering, and this is putting together the platforms. This is um, a, some of the pre-processing of the data, putting it into a format we can use, moving it at the right time, making sure it's backed up, making sure it can be trusted. Um, data science, which is much more the analytics, making sense of what's in the data. And then data-driven management, which is taking that output and actually doing something as a result of it, not just saying, hey, I've got this fantastic visualization, everyone should be really pleased with it. That is a much more useful thing than saying big data. And if you want to say big data these days, I would say that's much more what people talk about in data engineering. Uh, data science has kind of edged into that, but a lot of people get a lot more excited about the platforms, a lot more excited about being able to put the... Uh, the data into one big pot and think about it, rather than actually trying to understand what it can tell us and try and make some value out of it. Two things I've seen happening, and they both have the same reason why they're happening. There's a concept bouncing around a whole bunch of, uh, especially the large US banks right now, who are sort of in the vanguard of this, following the intelligence agencies getting there about 10 years ago, um, is the data lake. Uh, and the data lake is effectively a single platform. It may have some sort of multi-tenant technology on it. You might be using Accumulo, something like that, to split up the data. But it's a single platform somewhere in the business that all that data goes on to and a variety of use cases are deployed on. And the reason data lakes are turning up is that nobody can hire anybody that knows anything about this. This is a unicorn topic. This is even more of a unicorn topic than cybersecurity. Uh, cyber data scientists, Brilliant, they're, they're like pink unicorns. Um, so what, what's happening is they're, they're building centers of excellence in the business. They're putting that data engineering and data science talent in one place so that the various bits of their very large businesses can make use of it. And they're giving them one platform so that the various parts of their business can put their data in there and that one team can use it. Very common to see this now as an organization. What is happening is these centers of excellence, are the, I've spent the last year, in my experience, hunting around their businesses, looking for use cases. You know, somebody in senior management and exec has heard that everyone else is doing big data. They've thrown some money at a proof of concept platform. Now they need to prove enough value that they can get some more money and actually build something that scales out. Um, so they've been hunting around the business for use cases. 
a large part of that process is going to various bits of the business and saying, let me explain to you what big data or what data science can do for you. Go away and have a think for a month, and then come back and we'll talk about how, what we might be able to do. The really interesting thing here is security has been a data problem for a long time. You come to the security team and say, we've got this brilliant platform, we can take loads of data, we can do loads of analytics across it, and the security team will immediately go, brilliant, I've got use case one, use case two, use case three, use case four, use case five. And in every organization, they're building these platforms for business value, but invariably, some of the first use cases they're deploying are security. Uh, because frankly, we've already got the problem, we've just been waiting for a solution to come along. The other thing that data lakes have been providing is enrichment opportunities. So traditionally in monitoring platforms, we've been pulling in um, filtered data sets looking for specific problems, I'll talk about this in a minute, um, and it's all from security sources. So we're, we're taking security data and we're looking at security problems. The, the, issue, the, the opportunity that the data lake provides to us, potentially the threat as well, is that you're putting all that data into one place. You can start enriching from unexpected sources. So suddenly it's not just enough to know that somebody's uh, risky web browsing behavior or, or link clicking behavior, but that same person is popping up in an HR workflow somewhere. Well, maybe I want to pay a bit more attention to that. I wouldn't have seen the HR workflow beforehand. Uh, and so there are these opportunities for cross-business reuse of data, bringing data together. You've got a plan for that, because if you're in a very strict multi-tenant environment, you can't break those barriers. Uh, you've also got a plan for the fact that if you can break those barriers, they will, and so you need to understand what data in there is particularly sensitive and you don't want your marketing team going, oh, I wonder what we can do with the HR data. So where are we are at the moment? I, I think I said cyber is increasingly a data problem. We're, getting, we're collecting more and more data. There's more data flowing around. There are probes all over the place. It's useful. It's really useful. Um, we've had SEM for a long time. The value in SEM we can now understand. A lot of places aren't getting it, but they do, you know, the, it is now a known quantity. We know what we can get out of a SEM. We know what benefit we can get. And if you do it right, you get that benefit. We also know pretty much now what it can't give us because it's failed several times to do it. We're looking for known threat indicators. So we're looking for something that we know to be bad. Um, we're taking targeted subsets of monitoring data. So we're saying, I want to look for particular uh, web application attack. So I'm going to take my web application logs, I'm going to filter for that particular string, and then I'm going to analyze it. And I'm not going to look at any of the other logs that came off that web server. I'm not going to look at any of the other logs that came off of that infrastructure, because actually I'm looking for that particular signature in that particular place, which limits the ability to go wider in the analysis. That means you have to know in advance what risk you're worried about. Uh, it makes it very hard also to go back in time. So near real time, you're going to get alerts not far off the point it happens. Um, you get an alert or someone else more likely phones you up and tells you you've been popped. You want to go back and look at five months ago. You might have to take your SEM offline in order to be able to go back into an archive to be able to dig through and find out what happened, assuming you've got that data still archived. So there are limitations around SEM. It has benefit, it has value, um, but I think we've, we've worked out where that top boundary is. So what we're seeing, especially around the big data analytics, is there's a couple of very key use cases that people are adopting. Um, the first one is network behavior analytics. Uh, and you know, everyone, the, the other big catch, uh, catchphrase, which I haven't actually written anywhere in the deck, APT, targeted attacks, sophisticated attackers. Nation states who shall remain nameless, all the rest of it. Um, those guys, you know, we know what's happening there. We've got a bunch of attackers who go as sophisticated as they need to get. We've got a bunch of guys who take, uh, undertake campaigns of activity, and generally they put, they're getting straight past our monitoring solutions because they work out what they are, and they, they deliberately avoid them. They also, in, in the more advanced and the more... Uh, important attacks they conduct, they are using zero days. Um, not anywhere near as much as they, you'd be led to believe, but that sort of stuff is happening. That is really hard to pick up in your SEM, more or less impossible. You don't know what you're looking for there. Um, network behavioral analytics takes a lot more data. It looks at stuff outside of what we know to be bad, and it looks at everything. It does a certain amount of anomaly detection, but it also looks for behavioral footprints, regularity, the use by individuals, I'll come back to that. Um, 
and it does probable matches. So it's coming back to you and saying at the top of this list is something we really think is a bit worrying. At the bottom of this list is something that may or may not be worrying. You still need an analyst to sit there and go through that list and say, at this point I stop because this is all starting to be really obvious and not particularly uh, dangerous. But at the top here, actually that's interesting stuff I need to pick up on. It's all the monitoring data, it's over a larger period of time. Uh, we're seeing some of these analytic platforms reaching back six, 12 months of live data, uh, and then summarized data for as long as they've been up. And also we're seeing the ability to run retroactive analysis and in intelligence feeds. So more and more of us are subscribing to intelligence feeds, we're bringing in open source feeds, we're bringing in uh, commercial subscriptions. People are giving us these indicators of compromise, your competitor's been popped, another industry's been popped in another attack. Has that happened to us? Well, we didn't see it in the SEM. These platforms allow us to run that back, to go back nine months and say, bloody hell yeah, we were, we were popped then. And also, we, it allows us to bring together a lot more of these data sources, so internal and external. Um, the, the point around network behavioral analytics is you're looking for the modus operandi of the guy. You're not looking for the tool you're not looking for um, a particular packet type. You're looking for the um, characteristics and the sort of activity someone would be taking. So the, the, the really simple one to do is people use computers in a certain way. Malware tends to use CNC channels in a very regular way. There's a number of back off algorithms they can try and hide that with, but computers tend to be quite regular, people tend to be different. If you want to look like the people in an organization, that's actually quite difficult to get your malware to do, that's quite a complicated thing. So actually without knowing what a command and control channel is, you can probably spot some of that behavior, at least some of the simpler ones. Your, your, some of those back off algorithms start getting quite complicated and you do need to spend some time thinking about that. Data-enabled investigation is the other one that's caught of a lot of attention uh, and is leading to a lot of ROI. We're basically putting all this data into one pot. We're keeping it for a lot longer. Um, we've got a bunch of tools that allow for fast entity resolution, fast um, event resolution, and time, timeline visualization. It means when, when you've got that indicator or you've got that report from someone outside or maybe you've spotted you're being attacked, who knows, um, it's really quick. These guys are not spending three weeks trolling around, pulling off local logs. They're not, they're not trying to format one set of logs from Windows to another set of logs in Oracle, trying to work out the time difference. This stuff's all sitting in a database or a data store. And you've got a bunch of tools that allow you to manipulate that very quickly. It significantly reduces your time to investigate. Uh, and it also um, provides more context so suddenly things that are a bit risky, that doesn't look right. Let me go and see if I can find that elsewhere. Let me go and see if I can find associated behaviors with that. That's bad. You know, it allows for that sort of hunter investigation. I'm going to sit on my network and I'm going to hunt bad guys. I'm not going to wait for my, my systems to alert me. I'm not going to be an operator. These are the two key use cases um, that are driving a lot of the investment, a lot of the proof of concepts right now. And that's great but there's some dangers to what that's going to mean for us. So one of the things we're thinking about, if, you, if, if you're building one of these, it's not just a case of go and get yourself a download of Hadoop, go and get yourself something funky like Tableau or, or something probably even nicer like Gephi to do your visualization, a whole bunch of tooling you can download. It's not just a case of getting a slightly nerdy bloke who understands statistics to go and build you some an analytics. Um, th there's a whole set of capabilities you need here. It is the tooling. Uh, there's some interesting challenges with tooling in some of the customers out there I've been dealing with. Over time, an awful lot of corporate procurement has, has moved towards SANS, shared data, and virtualized servers. So their whole procurement process is about building large boxes that everyone shares. If you are going down the Hadoop route, and at this point in time, if you're doing big data and you're not going down the Hadoop route, you probably need a reason not to be. Um, Hadoop well, works in lots of small commodity hardware with local storage. So in theory, it's cheap to start small and to scale out. The problem is most large corporate procurement processes don't know how to buy those boxes anymore because they don't. They buy big boxes and they virtualize. Um, I've had customers who've had more trouble and spent more money on this trying to just buy pizza boxes than 
actually they, were, they spent on the data science part. It's, it's fascinating that these things become a problem for them. Um, so hardware and software, you need to understand what you're doing. That's the bit a lot of people talk about. People, that's the problem. The skills, there are, as I said before, there are unicorns. There's not these people out there. Processes. Um, this is something you start with a proof of concept, a bunch of clever guys who turn up every now and again and tell you, look what I've done, isn't this brilliant? Where you want to get to is a place where you've got change control on your scripts, where you've got um, testable scripts, where you've got the ability to professionalize your workflow, where you've got to understand where changes have happened and where data has come from. Um, that stuff takes effort. It doesn't just happen because a bunch of clever guys are playing with a platform. Data sources, and as I said, you start off here with everything that's already firing into your SEM, you start off with all the other people that are using the platform, and then you slowly but surely work around everything in your organization that you can instrument, and then you start thinking about new instruments you can put out there. The intelligence is understanding the context. Now, there's, there's interesting here that intelligence isn't just an external function. Uh, I was here two years ago talking about security intelligence. Got quite a lot of pushback from the audience, I seem to recall. Um, just be a bit smug about that. Uh, it is about understanding from external sources what's happening. Uh, it's also about understanding your own environment and what's happening in your environment. It's not just about uh, looking for bad guys. It's about understanding where are the big change programs. Who's bringing in a whole bunch of new IT? How are we changing the protocols in our control system estate? What's happening? Because when that stuff starts feeding through, you need to be prepared for it in the analytics, but you also need to understand what that means in terms of suddenly I've got a whole load of false positives for a new protocol I wasn't expecting. So it's external and internal intelligence. And the knowledge is the piece, and it's interesting, that's, that's partly around the team that are doing your analytics understanding what the business needs, but a significant part of that right now is telling the business what they can get and what the benefit would be. And that's, that's a real activity that, again, a bunch of clever guys in a room playing with Hadoop, come up with some stuff. If they're not out there talking to the management team and understanding what they want, that's all it'll ever be. If anyone's ever seen the Lambda architecture, they'll have seen something like this before. This is a fairly sort of common, um, common uh, high-level architecture for one of these platforms. A whole series of data sources, which you probably already have. A log management platform, which I would hope you've already got, because that should be feeding into your SEM that you've already got. Not to say that that's going to be effective or that's going to be right, so that might be something that needs to be improved. A whole bunch of enrichment sources, which you've already got, maybe. Surprised how many places don't have CMDBs or have CMDBs, and actually it's more dangerous looking at them than not. Um, and then you're talking about the analytics, the, the sort of core engines. And initially, batch analytics is where people end up. Uh, people talk about MapReduce. Historically, that was all Hadoop could do, no longer the case. Hadoop is now a, I think, once described as the equivalent of the Linux kernel for data. Uh, it will do a lot more. It's about bringing that data in. It's about storing it. One of the big benefits here is you don't need to transform the data on the way into your store. You just write it to disk. You worry about the transform when you do the analytics. You get your fast query store, so you start doing some of those um, pre-configured analytics so that you know that data is structured in the way you can get to it. Uh, and then you've got your analytics platform itself. Fairly simple stuff. In that, in that analytics area, you've got your engineer. He's running the platform. He's bringing your data in. And you've got your scientist. He's doing those analytics. He's producing that code, whether it's C++, whether it's Hive, whatever it is you're, you're writing in. You've got your structured data. So this is where you feed out a bunch of data into another database for a whole bunch of different tools to look at. There is no point replacing a whole bunch of existing tooling that doesn't, doesn't provide any, uh, va any more value replacing it. If it's already there, you might as well just feed it. But then you've got the visualization out. And, and this is interesting because everyone's talking about SOC analysts. Everyone's talking about threat intel analysts. Nobody at the moment is talking an awful lot about security managers. Uh, and they are going to be a key um, consumer of these platforms. So SOC workflow, in theory, you should have something. It should work. If you don't, that's got to be fixed. Threat Intel browser, the ability to take IOCs that you're pulling in from your sharing community, from your subscription feed, apply it to the data, see what pops up, start the investigation. Your visualization screen for the investigators to be able to start manipulating that data, looking for interesting patterns. 
Um, moving down the dashboard, classic security dashboard. Suddenly you've got all that data in one place. It's not just a case of going and asking someone once a month for a set of numbers, sticking them into a spreadsheet and creating a bar graph out the back of it. Now you can actually start producing that properly. Um, automated reporting, BI query, not that different. What is interesting and we have seen happening in intelligence communities, which is moving it to support this area, this more management area, are what are called question-focused data sets. Um, so this is not just a case of saying, I'm going to go into a massive data store and run some analytics across it. It's a case of saying, actually, I've got a particular area of concern. I don't know, firewall configs. I will go in and I will pull out from that data store in a common format, in a searchable manner, everything I know about my firewall configs, and I will jump that into a SQL database that then my management guys, who are not data scientists, but can use Excel, can use other business intelligence tools, can use Tableau, can manipulate at their level. Question-focused data sets are an increasingly useful thing, especially in uh, the management side. And, yeah, frankly, the uh, your analytics team will end up talking to everybody. Um, it's a communications role. Traditionally, your engineers and your scientists are not great communicators, so you're going to need someone in that team who can talk to people. Otherwise, it's just going to fall on its face. So that's kind of where we are now. Um, people are doing it. They're doing it for network defense. They're getting some ROI on it. There's an awful lot of vendors producing platforms that are starting to become closed. So there's a lot of vendors that will turn up and say, yeah, yeah, we're a Hadoop-based analytics vendor, but you've got to use our Hadoop distribution. You can't use anyone else's. And that breaks your data lake. You end up then with a security platform and then a business platform and a proliferation of, of big data platforms out there. This is dangerous. The reason this is dangerous is we are... You want, you want my finger in the air? Four or five years away from really knowing how useful this stuff is going to be and how we should use it properly. As a result, anything you invest in right now, which is a closed platform, could well be dead in four years. You might have to kill it and start again. You might lose that data. You might lose those analytics. One of the key things I, was, I would say coming out of this is we need to be building on open platforms because we don't know where we're going to end up yet. Open doesn't mean open source or, or free software. All the dirty GNU hippies can back off at that point. This is more about open in terms of, I want to be able to port those analytics. I want to be able to move that data. So why, why are people doing this? A lot of the reason I've been pulled in for organizations to talk about this is they all want to improve their cyber situational awareness, which is great. Everyone's got it in their strategy. And then nobody really knows what it is. So you spend a bit of time going and thinking about it. There's a lot of academic work out there on situational awareness. Um, strangely, you know, airline pilots is a big, air, big topic. Fighter pilots is a big topic. Um, the, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of work on it. There's a lot of models. They seem to be practical. There's very little in the way of reliable cognitive science behind it. So these are useful models, and they're as wrong as every other model ever is. Uh, Dr. Ensley came up with the free stage model in 95, and this is the one that makes sense to me. It seems to make sense to a lot of people. Um, fundamentally, situational awareness is perception. You need to be able to see the environment around you. So this is, this is understanding, not understanding, seeing. This is just seeing everything. And this is the promise that these big data platforms bring to us, is that we, don't, we no longer have to start throwing away data because it's too big for what we're, our analytics platform. Understanding is then saying, I can see all the nodes around me, I can see all the planes around me, I can see all the, all the computers on the network, I can see all the traffic. Do I understand why it's doing what it's doing? Do I understand how it interrelates? So understanding is second level, and then third level is what's going to happen next. So where's that plane going? It looks like it's pointing in that direction and going at that speed, so probably in the next 10 seconds it will be over there. Brilliant. That's prediction. That's not to say I predict I'm going to be attacked by this group in the next six months. You know, that's pretty much nonsense. But this is about, even when you're doing an investigation, I found a problem, I see that somebody's in a particular box, that's a couple of hops away from something I really care about. I've got a reasonable intelligence that suggests that they're after that particular asset. 
therefore I can roughly say that they're going to head in that direction and I need to start doing something about it. So it's seeing, understanding, predicting. And this correlates with, uh, I don't know if anyone's come across it, the OODA loop, um, observe, orientate, uh, decide, act. John Boyd, fighter pilot, US fighter pilot, uh, I think in the Korean War, worked out why they were getting their asses handed to them, uh, is that they had planes that supported a faster loop. They could see easier, they could make decisions easier, and they could move quicker. Uh, it wasn't about the fact that they had faster planes, it wasn't about the fact that they could go higher, it was that they could make decisions faster than the guys, than the Americans, and as a result they were shooting them down all the time. And he, in, in an adversarial relationship, it's not about being the best, it's about probably getting around that OODA loop faster. Can I see what you're doing? Can I understand what it is? Can I decide what I'm going to do about it? And can I make that action? And then get back around that loop again before you do. So in terms of situational awareness, operational cybersecurity, observe, orientate, decide, act. Situational awareness is quite clearly observe and orientate. That is telling us what's going on, do I understand it, um, and what's going to happen next. Decide and act is interesting, and I think one of the other big topics that we're going to be looking at over the next few years is automation. Uh, we all hear that there's a DARF of cybersecurity skills. There are no people out there that can do what we do. It's great. We all get paid a lot of money for it. There are no people out there that can do what we do. I can't hire anybody. I don't know about anyone else. Um, the problem here is only going to get worse. We will train more people, but the demand will still go ahead of that. Automation is going to be the answer. That's not to say we're all going to be come turning up in a box, plug it in, and there's your answer. What that is to say is taking each one of us in this room and giving us a 10 times force multiplier, get, getting us to be able to do more without so much hassle up front. So automation is about taking an awful lot of that low-hanging fruit. It's about making decisions and having actions happen without necessarily a human in the loop or maybe with a human in a small part of the loop rather than having to end to end. In terms of operational security, in terms of those roles I've got there, operators, hunters, responders, resolvers, again, I'm sure people have heard about this before, operators tend to be the guys in your SEM. These are the guys where a computer goes red, I, we've got an alarm, ring the bell. I'm probably doing them a disservice at that point. They under, you know, they're validating your incident. Your hunters are the guys who are sitting there and don't particularly have a day job. Their job is to sit there and go, I'm bored. I wonder what somebody's doing in our Oracle estate right now and goes off and has a hunt around and sees what they can find. They're the creatives, they're the, the guys who are using the analytics to look for stuff we don't know we need to look for. They're also the guys that you give your indicators from your partner organization that say, well, they've been popped using this, this, bit, this file, this approach, this scan. And he goes, right, I'm going to go see if we've been popped with that. And he has a hunt around the business. They're different people, they're different skill sets. Interestingly, the, the data platforms we're talking about are probably enabling both of them. Responders are the guys who are making decisions. So your hunters, your operators, put the flag up and say, we found something, it's definitely bad. We definitely need to do something about this. Anyway, I'm gonna go and find something else. Um, your responders are those guys that get called at five o'clock on a Friday to have to go and fix it. They're making decisions, they're, they're acting, but they need to understand the context of the decisions. Once they pick it up, they've got to be able to make multiple decisions. They can't go back to the operators and hunters. And you do find that you know, the hunting team and the responder team, there will be people that move between them, according to the day job. Um, but these are your, de your deciders. But they are also specialists in the field. Your resolvers tend not to be your security specialists. So this will be your networks team, this will be your Unix team, your database team. These are the guys that you issue tickets to and go, for God's sake, turn that off, for God's sake, patch this. Um, and they are, they are not the guys that need to understand what's going on. It's worth bearing in mind, all three of those roles that I think have a, a direct security responsibility have, to, uh, have some role in situational awareness. Now, I've spoken a little bit about management. Security management is on a slightly different cycle. I'd like to say it's not adversarial. That's not always the case. Um, but in theory, you've not got someone trying to beat you at security management. Generally, you've just got someone trying to beat you. Um, and this is much more the Deming cycle. So plan, do, check, act. This is much more about driving out efficiency. This is much more about uh, just making things work right. Uh, so 
if anyone's ever been beasted by 27001, Plan Do Check Act will have been beaten into you on the back of that. Um, it doesn't explain what it's talking about very well. Plan Do Check Act is a scientific approach to management. And it's effectively find out what your problem is, understand how you might fix it, make a plan up for what you're going to do, do it, did it work? If it did work, can we automate that? Can we standardize it? Can we make it better? Can we improve it? And then go back around and do it again. It's effectively an experiment. It's not presented as such. It's presented as plan, do, check, act, and at plan stage, you know exactly what the outcome's gonna be. But effectively, the original point of the Deming cycle was you would go through multiple iterations, you'd be very agile. Situational awareness is to the same degree those capabilities are needed in studying the situation, measuring success, studying the results, and I think in automation in uh, improve and standardize is gonna be an important piece. So I put a bit of context there around why people are doing it, and, and I'm leading up to what I think people should be doing next. So data-driven security management is moving beyond can I see the bad guys, can I catch my APTs, um, can I stop my data leaks, can I make some cool visualizations that will allow me to talk at a conference. Um, it's much more about actually making decisions in your organization based on what's working for your organization, um, not cargo cult. So the standards have helped, but invariably the standards that are out there have either been written in a bunker or in a bank. And you might be working in the same sort of bank, or you might be working in the same sort of bunker, but an awful lot of people don't. Um, and as a result, there's a lot of, well, this works in a bank, so it must work in my retail organization. This works in a bunker, so it must work in my manufacturing organization. And it's cargo car, it's the same thing. I see those guys, they're doing it, it looks good, I'm gonna do something like what they're doing. Who knows if that's the right thing for your organization? Who knows if actually you're performing a whole bunch of activities that are providing no benefit back to you? That's what we're talking about in terms of data-driven security management. It's understanding if something actually works for you. Yeah, take best practice, but then test it. Run it through the Deming cycle. This is, so metrics and performance metrics is one of the um, DARPA wicked problems, which continually has no solution at this point. I think there's an opportunity, uh, quantitative security management, there is an opportunity for us taking these data sets, running these experiments, to actually start understanding what metrics work and why they work. I think one of the key problems we've always had is we've been trying to come up with security metrics for an industry, for, a, for the world, and actually what you probably need are security metrics that work for your business. So quantitative data security, it's a problem we've got now. Uh, chances are you're already using Excel to do it. Excel is the world's data analysis platform. It's great for end users who are not specialists. Everything goes into it. Um, it's, it's a very quick and easy thing to build. It's impossible to do change control. It's terrible to test. Uh, you know, and it, it, it obscures the, the process by which it gets to the end result. Um, everyone uses Excel and we can do better. And this is where data science brings us a workflow, it brings us a scriptable workflow that breaks down these capabilities and gives us a lot more formalism and a lot more, uh, basically, ability to trust what the hell comes out the other end. If you're using Excel, really simply, the R language, statistics language, has a thing called a data frame. The Python language has a library called Pandas. Uh, the Clojure language has a library called Encanta. They will all provide that matrix view that Excel provides and allow you to apply statistics and data analytics directly to it. You can lift, most of them have then got something that will lift directly from Excel in and give you all that functionality. I thoroughly recommend it. If you're using Excel to generate all your graphs, oh, I bet they look lovely. Um, there's much better analytics tools out there. ClickView, I think, is a very popular one. I've tended to use Tableau. Um, again, if you've got in a CSV format, if you've got it in Excel format, you just throw it into, into there and you do a certain amount of analytics, but definitely the visualization in those platforms. So the, the nature of these quantitative security management problems are mixed data sources. So I'm pulling in lots of different tooling. I'm pulling in lots of different people's reports. Um, Visualization, somehow I need to be able to go back and tell people this is good, bad, getting worse, getting better, should have given me that money or 
maybe you shouldn't. Um, it generally has a set of questions around the same topic. So it's not just I've got a question to answer, it's I've got a topic and I need to know a number of different answers. Am I performing? Um, is my, are my controls working? Are they performing well? Has my risk gone down? Have I spent too much money? All these sorts of things I need to understand about the same area. Uh, and generally this is summary statistics. So anyone who is doing any form of security consultancy, who at any point says you have 10 red risks versus 40 amber risks, you're doing very basic summary statistics. At any point you're saying your median risk is this or your uh, mean risk is this, you're doing summary statistics. That's not big data analytics. It's kind of the bottom end of data science, but do you know what? You can formalize that. There's an awful lot you can pick up and run with on that. Most security consulting, especially when you're reporting out of the technical layer into the management layer, you're doing some form of summary statistics. If you can understand what summary statistics are, and you understand what the opportunities in there are, you can provide a lot more value. These sorts of things, trend analysis, security posture, perimeter view, operational KPIs, controls performance, all being done generally if someone in your security team's got a honking great big Excel spreadsheet with an enormous series of pivot tables in it, that's a really good opportunity to do this. So the first one that I've seen in a number of customers that has been a massive pain point is vulnerability management. You know, you're pulling in patch uh, lists, you're pulling in external in notifications, you're pulling in your vulnerability scanners, you're pulling in internal tickets to see where they're at, and you're producing probably on a monthly basis, if you're really good on a fortnightly basis, what are my biggest problems and how am I performing against it? And I've seen senior, senior security management people spending two weeks of the month churning data in Excel to produce these reports of spreadsheets that convince other bits of the business to do their jobs. All that stuff becomes a lot faster and a lot easier when you've got a workflow defined and a series of scripts that you can maintain. Uh, it's a clear candidate for question focus data set. Put all this data in a spot, pull it out in a form that you can run SQL against. Then you've got a whole series of business intelligence tools you can use to query it. Executive dashboard, same thing. Interestingly, an awful lot of the data going into that isn't going to come out of your technical estate. A lot of that will come out of other reporting people do, instant reports, risk registers, project plans, that sort of thing. That data gets, that flows around all over the place. Um, again, you will generally have someone who spends a week a month in a security management team reading all of those, cop maybe copying and pasting some data into another Excel spreadsheet, or more likely retyping and, and starting again, and then producing a, a one-page dashboard at the back of that, that can be better. Um, the other thing here is you generally have multiple stakeholders. So you might be saying, oh, I'm giving it to the board or to the exec team. And you know, the CTO, the CIO, the CFO, all going to have different, the senior risk officer, they're all going to have different questions they want to ask and want to have that dashboard tell them, yes, you're managing it, I don't need to worry about it. That's a really good candidate for interactive visualization, giving them just enough tooling that they don't need any training, they can pull some sliders, they can press some buttons, and they can get a different view of the data depending on what they want from it. And that's the application of visualization, the application of analytics, the application of data science. It's not particularly big, although there is a lot of variety in there. So then we've got some other opportunities that are, are starting to appear. They're not the early adoption cases that people are doing right now. One of these is risky staff behavior. So right now, our network behavior analytics is saying, what is the risk that this behavior I'm looking at is a bad guy? And it's scoring it. And once you get above a certain threshold, somebody investigates and so tries to prove out and verify if that's the case. If I can see what that bad guy is doing on the network, I can see what good guy is doing on the network. If I can see what good guy is doing on the network, I can see how risky they're being. So what I can do is rather than necessarily fish them once a year, I can watch their behavior with links and emails. I can watch their surfing behavior. I can watch their emailing content around to each other behavior. And I can start putting risk scores to that. They may be sending something which is not not marked, not confidential in your organization to somebody else. And they might do that on a fairly regular basis. That that's, might indicate that if they ended up with something that was confidential, they might do that as well. There, there were a series of different behaviors that people would perform at different levels. You run an awareness campaign, you, you know, did that work? 
well, you know, our fishing campaign the next year still caught someone. Well, of course it did. Everyone gets caught by fishing at some point. Um, this, this allows you to report back on trends. It allows you to see the effectiveness. It also allows you to say, actually, the Hong Kong office are bloody terrible at this, and we need to go and do some targeted training on those guys and put the wind up them a bit and get that sort of uh, focus. So it's, this isn't looking for bad guys. This isn't looking for malicious activity. This is looking for that accidental risky activity that people perform. Significant benefits to be had doing that. Automated instant response. We're starting to see products coming out for this, which is interesting. Um, and this is saying, when I've got that threshold that says above 80%, I'm going to check and see if it's an instant. And above 95%, I'll assume it's an instant. Or if it's in a particular network segment that holds high value assets, I'm going to assume it's instant and take action anyway and then worry about afterwards. You pre can your change controls. I want to change my firewall, my routing, I want to change my server configs, I want to drop a whole bunch of things that I think are vulnerable but aren't that critical. Um, and you pre can that, and when you hit a certain threshold, stuff happens on your network. Significantly improves your response time, significantly limits the extent of an attack. I think this is undoubtedly the way to go. To the same degree that everybody when IPS turned up said, oh my god, you're going to get in the way in the business and we're all going to get shot. Yeah, this is going to be risky. It's probably at some point there's going to be a tipping point between the riskiness of not doing it and the riskiness of doing it to the business. The other thing here also though, um, increased targeting monitoring. So you've just sent the alert off to your uh, your instant responder who's home in bed at two in the morning, he's going to take an hour to get to the office. Actually, by the time he turns up, why don't you get an hour's worth of targeted monitoring of the endpoints that have just triggered that alert? So he turns up and he's got a lot more data than he would otherwise have had. Um, that's useful. The other thing is, you've identified something, it looks like bad behavior, push a button, and it immediately distributes that to all your other endpoints. So you found that one egress point in Asia has been popped, and there's been a particular set of IP addresses or a particular set of attack types. It automatically pushes that out to all your other egress points and starts looking for the same data, uh, or actually looks for that data in your data lake. Um, that's coming. I think automated response is, is, in, is coming. I think there are very interesting new products turning up on the market for that. That's big data security and its opportunity on the horizon. The future is what I was talking about earlier. This is experiments to identify if something works for you. So this isn't good practice or best practice. This isn't do it because it's written down and the ISF or the ISO or the government or anybody else tells you it's a good thing. It's you do it and you measure it and you do it in one place and you don't do it in another place. You come back and you say, was that worth doing? Here's a great question. Does your antivirus in a business unit in Asia provide you any benefit? Are you getting, if you took that antivirus off, would you have a, a higher increase of instance to worry about down there? Would you lose more data? Dangerous experiment to take, but actually, am I spending to deploy multiple antivirus endpoints all across my business? Am I having a whole team who manages that for, for, because everybody else says it's a good idea? Or actually, do I have other controls that are already mitigating the risks I'd have? These are the sorts of questions you want to start asking yourself. It's about iterations. It's about doing the experiment. Did it work for us? Let's try that again, do it again. Oh, yeah, it does work. Right, let's automate it. Let's push that into the business. Now, this, I think, is going to fundamentally change the nature of the chief security officer. Um, there are some skills you need to do for hypothesis-driven security management. You need to understand how to form a hypothesis. That's actually quite a difficult thing in the first place. Um, you need to go and convince senior people to do something a bit risky to find out if you can be more effective. Um, and then you need to understand what it tells you and go and make a change happen to make it worthwhile doing in the first place. Now, some of those are data science skills. Understanding how to write the hypothesis, understanding what the outcome of it is, actually doing the experiment, probably are more data science skills. Getting the air cover to do it, making the change happen, that's more CISO. That's more security officer, that's more talking to senior management and getting stakeholder buy-in. Um, however, the CISO can't do that unless he understands what the hell the data scientist is talking about. And increasingly, my view is, CISOs will become data literate. And if they won't, that may be the end of a, a productive career in security management. Um, 
think that's a quite a bold statement. I didn't realize I was going to say that. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that's my future. I, I think this is where we're heading towards. I think there's a serious benefit if we do it. Uh, and I think this will fundamentally change a lot of security. It won't any longer be a case of I measure my security by the percentage of my IT budget. It will actually be a case of I measure my security by the effectiveness of the activities I perform. We've got a long way to go before we can do that yet. So, there are no silver bullets. This stuff is not going to solve any problems. We're going to have problems. This stuff might, should, hopefully act as a force multiplier. It should make us better. Um, we will still need people, uh, but we're also going to need automation. We're going to need those people to be able to do more. We're going to need those people to understand how this analytics platform is working, how these analytics, what they do, what they tell us, and how useful they are. Right now, we need to build open platforms. Um, the danger is we, build, we go and buy some vendor product in the next six months that is great at network behavior analysis and terrible at anything else. And suddenly, do you have a stack for network behavior analysis, a stack for security management, and a separate stack elsewhere for marketing? You know, go with open platforms, because otherwise you're going to get trapped. Uh, and you need to invest in these analytics skills. They're not, these people are not going to just appear in your business. There is not a pool of anal anal analysis, analysts sitting in the marketplace right now looking for work. You know, I, I've been to these conferences, I've spoken to these guys. They are even more highly sought after than we are. And you know, it's a great place to be in right now, security. It's a better place to be in data analytics. Um, if you don't invest in those skills, you won't get them. So, my final statement here, and I'm running very short. Security is transforming from a subjective art to a data and automation discipline. And that is probably my two to three year prediction. Any questions? Thank you very much.